Okay. So today's episode is so interesting. This is with Kara Collier. She comes to us from NutriSense. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you may have seen recently, I was wearing the NutriSense continuous glucose monitor. Um, so fascinating. If you're not familiar with what that is, it means that you're wearing a little device. It's in the, it's in the back of your arm and it's continuously measuring your glucose, your blood sugar response. So you can see where your blood sugar is at while you're sleeping, while you're exercising in response to food in response to stress. So good. And so a little background on Kara, she herself is a registered dietitian, nutritionist and certified nutrition support clinician. Um, she has a background in clinical nutrition, nutrition technology, and entrepreneurship. Um, she became so frustrated with the traditional healthcare system that she helped start NutriSense where she is now the director of nutrition. So she oversees the health team there and product development. And she personally has interpreted thousands of complex glucose data sets. This is so fascinating to hear her talk about the bio individuality of blood sugar response. Oh, this is to me, this is pioneering the next level of human nutrition, because instead of us just saying, us just saying, this will give you a high glycemic response. And this is a low glycemic food. What we're finding is, is a different story that really depends on the person. So she's going to get into that in the episode. So, so fascinating, very cool. And also just educating you on blood sugar in general, what you're looking for, what kind of response is healthy, what tends to give us poorer outcomes um, in terms of energy on, in the, on the daily and also long-term. Um, so this is a really, really informative episode. Kara is so great. Um, she does such a great job at sharing this information. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. Here is Kara Collier. All right, guys. So I'm, I'm really excited in this episode for us to be able to talk about uh, what healthy blood sugar looks like, because at least for me growing up, my mom was, a, had type two diabetes, has type two diabetes. And that was my first intro to like even caring about blood sugar. But my impression was like, you kind of just don't worry about it unless you have diabetes. <laughs> like that's what, that's where the knowledge base was when I was a kid, you know, and I feel like there's a lot of that still. So, um, I guess before we get into what CGMs are and continuous glucose monitoring, can you kind of share why we want to start looking at blood sugar before it becomes too late and you find out you have type two diabetes? Can you educate us a little bit about the importance of healthy blood sugar, what that means for us? Absolutely. So I really like to think about glucose as a vital sign. So just like heart rate or something like that, that fluctuates yeah. day to day in response to your exercise, your stress, your sleep, what you're eating, when you're eating glucose does the same exact thing. So glucose is affected by all these core tenets of just good health and so when you're able to monitor it before you have diabetes or before you have a problem, you're getting insight into all these different factors. And it's then able to help you prevent any type of chronic condition. And so it's not just, you know, am I eating carbs or not? Or am I diabetic or not? You know, right. glucose so, so much deeper than that. So at a really high level, that's how I describe it as it's just this insight into exactly how your body is functioning and you get to see early on, maybe what your Achilles heel is. So is it, it's really sleep. I'm like, you know, lacking on sleep. That's where I need to focus in order to be the best version of myself, not just not a diabetic, but the best version of myself. Mm -hmm. And so it comes down to being able to see all these different factors that influence our health. And while the end stage of really out of control glucose values is diabetes and insulin resistance. And we know that insulin resistance doesn't just increase our risk for diabetes. It increases our risk for just about every chronic condition there is. So cardiovascular disease, dementia, all types of neurological diseases, mm -hmm. kidney disease, hypertension, PCOS, all of these things are related to insulin resistance, which of course, insulin and glucose are, are very related. Whenever our mm -hmm. glucose goes up, we need insulin to take care of that. So it's not just helping provide insight on if you're diabetic or not, but it's also helping to prevent all those chronic conditions that are affecting us. 
but that's sort of the end stage. Like that's like my yeah. glucose is really dysregulated. I have some insulin resistance and I have some potentially diabetes, but before that is also just energy, right? Mm -hmm. So glucose is our body's primary energy source, whether mm -hmm. you're not eating carbs or not, we always have glucose present because our body want needs glucose to run, you know, off of fuel. So there's certain organ systems that only can use glucose for energy or they prefer to use glucose. So we always have some floating around in our bloodstream. You know, there's yep. usually about like four to five teaspoons at a time of sugar in the bloodstream. That's a pretty tight range if you think about it. And so the body's constantly working to keep it in this really tight range. So mm -hmm. if you're monitoring it and you see it's, it's just a little bit above that range, that's a signal your body's working hard to, you know, get it back to normal. And so it's also a signal of how your body is able to self-regulate, mm -hmm. which is incredibly important because we need to know like, where is something going wrong? And if we can catch that early, it might just be like a tweak of, oh, we need to adjust this meal. You know, that's all it is. And we're good. Whereas if we catch it 20 years down the road, when you have a diagnosis of diabetes, we have a lot of accumulated damage at that point. And it's not that we can't reverse diabetes. We certainly can, but it's much harder than if we catch that right. early yellow flag early on. So that's a long answer. I could keep going on no. and on about why no, glucose uh, so is many, important. <laughs> yeah. So many things are coming up. Okay. So like you mentioned sleep and I've looked at the research sleep is crazy on how it impacts our insulin sensitivity and our blood sugar levels. I know you guys have seen that. Mm -hmm. So like, and I'll let you share, but sleep and what else, like what are some big hitters that you have seen from having people be able to test like every second what their blood sugar, which is so cool, right? Like it's cool to prick your finger and see what your fasting blood sugar is. And like, maybe like 30 minutes after a meal, 60 minutes after a meal, 90 minutes, you know, like we've done it like that, but be able to be able to see it like on demand is really cool. So from all of you, I mean, you guys have so much data. It's so crazy and so exciting, but what are some other big hitters that you've seen have impact people's blood sugar? Yeah. And so there's four big pillars that we mm, talk about of cool. how, what affects glucose. And I kind of describe it like a chair. They're each equally important. It's the legs, legs of the chair. If we are missing one of these, it's going to fall over and you can't stand up straight. So one of those is nutrition. And of course that's a whole rabbit hole of nuances of what that looks like, yeah. but we have to look at nutrition and what you're eating. Of course. The second is exercise and movement, just how active you are just as important for blood sugar yep. regulation. The third is, you know, kind of, we lump it as like fasting and meal timing when you're eating, mm. how often you're eating that has a huge impact regardless yeah. of the meal content. Mm -hmm. And then the fourth one we group together as a big category of stress. So mm. in that is psychological stress, physical stressors, if you're overtraining or if you're sick. Um, and then sleep, that's a stressor on the body. So if you're getting inadequate sleep, poor sleep, poor quality sleep, it's essentially a stressor on your body because we need that time to recuperate. So those are our four big categories that we absolutely have to dial in and pay attention to if we want to have great glucose control. And then of course, there's tons of nuances outside of that that are more edge cases, but that's where you know the bulk 80-20 rule, we want to focus on those four categories. And for people who don't know, what do you recommend for healthy, uh, fasted morning blood sugar ranges? And then in response to meals, what do you recommend? Yeah. So, and I guess to paint a better picture of a CGM in case maybe you haven't yeah. heard of it, you're basically getting 24 seven glucose data without having to prick your finger or draw any blood or anything. So for two weeks you get nonstop data. Um, and so with that, we get to see all these nuances you don't normally get to check on, you know, a finger prick or right. at a lab. Right. And it's so super cool. It's, it's awesome. Cause nobody knows what's happening to their glucose when they're yeah. sleeping, unless you're wearing a CGM. It's, it's really exciting. It was more fun than I thought it was guys. If you're listening, I had one for a couple of weeks and I, I kind of was like, Oh, cause I'm a little bit more of a naturalist. Like I have an aura ring and I have, a, but I'm kind of like, yeah, but I'm not going to like, let it run my life. I don't know what I'll think of this. Uh, continue. Oh, I loved it. It was so fun. It was like this awesome, like mystery detective <laughs> inside my, I'm like, look what happens when I run at this speed. And then look what happens when I run at this speed. Yeah. Like, it's super fun. Sorry. C continue on. <laughs> yeah. It's addicting. <laughs> yeah. It's really cool. It's really fun. But when we're looking at the data and this is specifically for non-diabetics with the goal of 
disease prevention, health optimization, we're looking for that fasting glucose value. So without food for at least eight hours, but you know, usually overnight and into the morning of 70 to 90 would be ideal. So if you go to your doctor and you get a fasted glucose value, it might come back as 99 and they say that's normal. Technically anything under a hundred is considered normal, but based off of the research we look at, we were looking at 70, 90, which is more optimal. Agreed. Um, and some people, some non-diabetics actually run a little lower, especially if you know you're in a higher levels of ketosis, you might be running yeah. in the sixties. And if you feel fine, that's totally fine too. We yeah. get that question a lot, but yeah. general rule of thumb 70 to 90 for the fasted. And then what about swings from eating? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. And this is where the insights are amazing with the CGM. Cause you can see exactly what that cur glucose curve looks like after you've eaten something. Whereas like, you know, if you're using a glucometer at home, you could check it 30 minutes and then 60 minutes and then 90 minutes. First of all, it's going to hurt your finger if you're checking yeah. it that many times, but you're also missing some things. So what we're looking at is a few different metrics and all of this is captured in the app, which is also really awesome. Mm -hmm. So you can see how high it goes. That's, you know, pretty straightforward. We want to stay below 140 most of the time. So if you're a generally healthy person and you hit 150, nothing, you know, it's terrible. is going to happen. The goal is that we're not hitting 150 every single morning at breakfast over and over right. is that most of the time we're staying below 140. Then we're looking at how big does that curve look like? So inside our app, we have two metrics. One is just called area under the curve. It's basically like, you know, is it a skinny narrow curve where it's like you spiked at 150 and then you came back down really fast? Or is it like you climbed up to 150 over two hours and then it took you three hours to come back down? That slow climb and slow back down, that's a lot of area under the curve. It's a big response. So we're looking at that, like what does that shape look like? We yeah. wanna see you come back down to pre-meal glucose values within about two to three hours of eating. That shows good general insulin sensitivity. So we're kind of, Beautiful. and that's why each person, each new customer gets a dietitian assigned to them. And so we can point out things like this in the app because it can get confusing or, you know, for the person who really wants to dial in on this, there's somebody there to answer questions if you have it. Um, yeah, which is huge, by the way, like <laughs> I just have to pause for a second to make sure you guys heard that you literally get a dietitian assigned to you. Like I was amazed how you were, you guys were watching over and like asking questions like, Hey, we noticed like your numbers drop down. I'm like, yeah, I think I bumped it or something. I was like, wow, dang, this is some like really <laughs> amazing customer service. So that's a, like a huge, huge benefit of wearing it is you actually have a dietitian giving you feedback. It's kind of like hiring a coach for almost free. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, and, and of course I'm a dietitian, so I'm a little biased, but I think that is so important to have that human touch to make sure you're, yeah. you're understanding the data and getting the most out of it. Yeah. You know, because my goal is really to make people the healthiest versions of themselves. I don't want them to walk away from the experience thinking, oh, you know, I did this and that's why my glucose was bad and they missed the point or something. Right. I want them to walk away with the right insights. So we make sure the dietitian is there to help you as little or as, you know, as much as you want. So some people are really using the dietitian a lot and some people yeah. just there if they have a question and, and that's fine, but they are there in order for you to make, you know, make the most out of your data. But in that postprandial response, like we were touching on, we're looking at that shape and, and how big was that glucose response? You know, maybe you went from 70 to 120 and that's not up to 140, but that's a big jump. Whereas yeah. if you went from 70 to 100, that looks a little different. So we're looking at all these different factors and we kind of have some of these metrics in the app to kind of help you along and, and figure it out. But that's another thing. I have a random question for you. Mm -hmm. Um, I am curious your thoughts. I, I was talking about, um, the CGM that one of my clients is wearing right now. And she was telling me, she was like, I get a bigger, um, a way bigger, uh, blood sugar jump from eating strawberries than I do from bananas. And I mentioned that in a podcast interview with a doctor and he thought his, he was like, it's possible. I wonder if she's having an alert, a little bit of an allergic reaction to the strawberries causing her to elicit a bigger blood sugar response. And I really like thought about that. I'm like, that's a really interesting thought. Do you have any thoughts? I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. 
Yeah. And I have two thoughts. So one is that it is one of the biggest insights we learned when we started to just see a lot of people's data, because this really isn't research what's normal glucose data in a non-diabetic. It's kind of was like wild, wild west yeah. when we started doing this. But what we've realized is we are all super unique and our glucose responses to food are really not predictable almost to some extent. Like wow. traditionally we use glycemic index, right? Which is like, okay, we're guessing that a banana is going to spike your glucose more than a strawberry because on average, when we studied this, most people responded higher to banana. So a glycemic index is a higher score for banana, but that, that was like an average score. So what we're realizing when we see people try all these different things is there's tons of people in between there. So like, I personally have tried just about like every fruit just to know how I respond mm -hmm. in the same portion sizes. So like, you know, 30 grams total carbohydrates of a right. bunch of different fruit. Yeah. And banana is actually one of my lowest ones as well. Wow. And that surprised me too. Cause I always was like, ah, I probably shouldn't eat too many bananas or super starchy, right. but you know, lo right. and behold, I actually respond really well to bananas and way wow. worse to other fruit. So that's one factor is, you know, we just have these really different responses to food and, and you don't really know that unless you're measuring it, which is another really important insight. So, you know, maybe she just responds better to yeah. bananas like myself, but with the food intolerances, we are seeing a connection here to some extent. So mm -hmm. sometimes people like I had an example of somebody recently where they kept having a glucose spike, not a big spike, but like a 20 point increase from macadamia nuts on their own, which you would not expect. And so, right. you know, there's no carbs, basically, mm -hmm. it really shouldn't be raising your glucose. And then she did a food sensitivity test and macadamia nuts were way high on the list. All right. And like, huh. And so there's connections there that we're certainly noticing, but that doesn't mean that every food you have an intolerance to, you're also going to have a glucose spike too. Yeah, so okay. it's, it's not like a perfect connection, but it certainly happens sometimes. Sometimes. Have you had any other interesting finds like the banana, like the banana thing is super interesting, right? Like I don't think yeah. there could be a fruit more demonized than the banana, <laughs> especially in my little like keto metabolic health world. Like I've had friends joke with me about it. They'll send me texts of like, I did something really bad. <laughs> I <laughs> half a banana. <laughs> um, but uh, what have there been any other like surprising finds? Um, I guess either in yourself or others that you found like, wow, we thought that would like make it go crazy high or vice versa. Yeah. I mean, I can definitely speak to some huge surprises I had for myself where sure. I know other people have opposite responses. So it's certainly not across the board because we're all just so different, which, you know, banana was one of my big ones. Cause I like love bananas, but I always ate them thinking there was some like, you know, yeah. naughty food because they're so <laughs> starchy, starchy, but right. it's, yeah, it's actually one of the best fruit for me and my body. And for whatever reason, you know, we think wow. it's a combination of probably microbiome, um, and just like mm -hmm. genetics that's causing these variances and responses, but you know, I'm sure there's also other factors that we just don't know of why they're responding differently. But another thing that was interesting to me is I tried a bunch of different, um, like grains. And so mm -hmm. I tried like white rice versus wild rice versus black rice and brown rice. And then also like quinoa and white rice was actually the best response, which I was like, wow. I'm not really sure why but then like i like white rice the best I, out of all of those so again i was like a win-win for me I the things i this. like actually end up being better but wow, that was like that. a surprise where it's like i used to you know pay the like surcharge to have quinoa instead of white rice and now i'm like i'll stick with the white rice wow that's amazing i i did yeah. personally i did get a spike more of a spike from white rice but like i i i love what you're saying right now because when I became involved in the ketogenic community, one of the first things that I did, like I really re rejected it. First of all, like I was like, mm, let me look at nature. Let me look at humanity. Let me look at the history of the world. Let me like really think about this on like a, just kind of a common sense level. Let me see what the healthiest populations in the history of time have eaten. And the one, there were two things uh, that went together with all the healthiest populations in the history of time. And one was seafood and the other was rice. And I was like, <laughs> interesting, you know, and I, sometimes I'm getting my nails done by like Vietnamese ladies and they're just so tiny and like, they just, their skin is glowing and they look so healthy. And I'm like, what, so what do you guys usually eat the most of? They're like a lot of rice, a lot of rice, <laughs> a lot of vegetables, meat and rice, you know? And so I, I always think about that. And while of course I'm a huge fan of ketogenic, um, interventions, especially to replace something that's been lost. I love what you're saying because it's 
removing the stigmas and demonization of foods, which I think can also be really unhealthy for us to just blanket statement. Like that's bad. That's good. That's bad. That's good. That's doesn't put us in a good, healthy relationship with food. And what you're showing is like, guess what? You can actually find out for you if it really is like something you want to avoid or not, which is so cool and so empowering that we can find out, you can just test and find out what your glycemic response actually is. So thank you for sharing that. Yeah. And, and the biggest thing people are always like, what should I eat? What should I do? And all I can say is there's really no one size fit all like, beautiful. of course, lean towards whole foods, try to minimize your amount of processed foods as close to the natural form as possible is a good golden rule. But at the end of the day within whole foods, even there's no one size fits all. And we really, and that's again, why the dietitian is there because it's so personalized and we, and that's why I'm like, I hate the dogma of like these really black and white lines of what's good and what's bad, because Mm -hmm. it's just not that simple. And I'm sure, you know, working with real people, it never is that simple. Never. (laughs) That's why I have such a hard time when someone's preaching like, this is the way all humans should eat. I'm like, you clearly don't work with people one-on-one or something because there's no way I would ever say something like that. (laughs) What, what, what I can literally have two people on the same, same exact advice, same startup plan, same foods, same meal plan, same, you know, catering to their own caloric needs. And one can be like, you're saving my life. This is the best thing that I have ever done. Like I have no cravings. I've never felt so good. Thank you so much. The weight's just falling off. And the other person is like, I hate this and I'm hungry all the time and I have no energy. And (laughs) so, yeah, I mean, that is truly how bio individual we are in our response to food. So I love that the, the NutriSense is giving you the opportunity to actually like be empowered. I love that you said like, go figure the foods I actually like are the ones that are best for me. Like, that's what I usually, I feel like as a coach, I'm usually just kind of here to give scientific backup to what people kind of already knew in their gut (laughs) that they should do. You know, so you guys are also giving that scientific backup, which is really, really cool. And I want to talk about like the actual device because before I tried yours, I was like, like, wait, what, like, what is going on here? Is there like this, do I have like an IV in my arm? Like, (laughs) what is it? How does it actually go in? Can you, I I guess, um, I I do have a video where I showed it. It's on my Instagram, but, um, could you try to describe in words, like how the actual device like sticks in your arm? (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Um, a lot of people are intimidated by it, but it is really simple process. So you don't have to go to a doctor to have it applied or anything. You do it at home. So we ship it to you and it's just a little device. And the actual CGM is about the size of a quarter and it goes on the back of your arm. So like tricep area. And essentially all you have to do is it comes in this applicator and I describe it as an easy button because that's exactly what it looks like. (laughs) And you literally put the easy button against your arm and just push the button and it's in there. And so what's happening actually behind that process is there is a small needle just during insertion, but the needle doesn't stay in you. So inside that applicator easy button, the needle is just pushing it in. And what it's pushing in is this tiny microfilament and it just stays just below the surface of the skin. So not even deep enough to go to your blood. It's actually measuring interstitial fluid, which is just the fluid between Mm. your cells. So it's this tiny microfilament that just gets put in a little bit by that needle. The needle gets thrown away inside that applicator. And then that device, it has an adhesive on it. So it stays on your arm and it stays there for the 14 days. And then to get the data from the device, you just scan it with your phone. And so yeah. let's say I wake up, I scan it and I can see my glucose values from when I was sleeping. So the device itself holds up to eight hours of data at a time. So you just have to scan it at least once every eight hours and it's gonna pull all that past data for you. Yeah. You explained that really well. I, if you guys want to see a video of it, it's on my IGTV on Instagram, um, coach Tara Garrison, but like, you can watch me cause I'm like, okay, I'm going to do it. And I'm like all bracing myself and my, I laughed so hard when I saw the video cause my, <laughs> I got a lot of responses too of people like laughing faces. Cause I'm like <laughs> bracing myself so much. And then I'm like, 
I literally didn't feel anything. Like I didn't feel anything. I didn't even feel like I didn't know anything happened. I was like, oh, okay. Well, it hurt actually less. I mean, it didn't hurt at all. So it was less than even a finger prick, you know, a finger prick you feel. So if you're worried about like being worried about the needle thing, I would say, don't worry about it. Cause I literally didn't feel a thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've used like 15 of these probably more and I've n- never feel it at all. It truly is painless. Um, yeah. Nobody ever believes me until they try it, yeah. but it truly like, is. Oh, I didn't, I don't know. Okay. Oh, it's in there. Cool. Okay. Um, and then the other thing that's really cool is I love that you can on demand scan it whenever you want. Right. So on one hand, it's playing in the background so I can see like while I was sleeping or while I wasn't thinking about it, I can go back and look, but I can also get it on demand, which I thought was really cool because for me, I like high performance athletic activities. Like I like to go kill it in the gym. That is so like, literally I'm doing that after this interview and I can't freaking wait. Like it is like my favorite thing to do is just go kill it in the gym. And I was, uh, running, I was running and it was so cool to be able to do it mid run and just watch my blood sugar just skyrocket from doing like really fast sprint style runs. Like you, you learn just how much glycogen your muscles dump out into your bloodstream to fuel that kind of performance, which for me was also kind of indicative of, well, no wonder I'm pretty carb tolerant. No wonder I can eat more carbs because I'm dumping all this Mm -hmm. stored glycogen out during this activity. So I'm going to go eat carbs out and just refill glycogen. I'm not going to get fat from that. So it's really cool to be able to see that happen, like literally know and see that that's happening. Um, another thing, uh, sorry, I, I, I'm like talking too much, but I'm just like, I got to tell you, Kara, it was so cool. I like, (laughs) this is, well, this one's kind of embarrassing, but I like went on a first date, like a lunch date. And I was fasted all morning. And during the date, all I had was a, like a grilled chicken lettuce wrap sandwich. Right. So like basically no carbs, my blood sugar was like skyrocketing. And I seriously think it was just from stress. I was just, yeah, so you're probably nervous. (laughs) (laughs) So that was really crazy to see too, how being nervous and stressed emotionally, even though I didn't really feel like it, I thought I was being all cool and blah, blah, blah. Mm -mm, (laughs) Blood sugar doesn't lie. I was nervous. (laughs) So that was cool to see too. The emotional impact is a huge, huge factor we're talking about all the time. Cause a lot of times, like you said, you're like, I'm not stressed. Like I'm mm. fine. And I'm like, I can see it in your data or it'll be this <laughs> chronic background stress where people are just so used to being stressed all the time that they can no longer even recognize it. Right. It's just, what's your normal is your normal. And you're not even acknowledging the fact that you're stressed because you're working all the time or you're super busy yep. or whatever is going on. And a lot of times what we'll see is your fasting glucose, especially. So, um, overnight values, morning time values mm. are really impacted by chronic stress, especially because when we're chronically stressed, we're pumping out hormones like cortisol and adrenaline, which is telling the liver make more glucose. Like we're under stress, yep. we need energy. So it's pumping out glucose, even though you're not eating, you don't need energy. We don't need that extra glucose circulating around. So a lot of times people are like, you know, my meals are dialed in. I figured out how to reduce spikes, but these fasting values, I cannot get them down. And it's almost always stress. And sometimes we'll see this pattern where that's high during the weekdays and maybe on the weekends, they get some relaxation and it's lower. And it's like, well, let's see these patterns. And that's the first time people can realize maybe I'm under more stress than I, than I thought, you know, you can make these connections that are sometimes really hard to quantify for people of Mm -hmm. just like, it's not tangible. You know, they're like, I'm not stressed and I don't want to keep pushing it. So now we have this amazing tool of like, well, the data can tell us maybe you are stressed. Um, so it's, it's a huge factor. We're talking about all the time, anything that stimulates that cortisol reaction. And again, sleep is, is plays a role here as well mm-hmm. of a bad night of sleep, whether that's interrupted sleep, like you're on edge cause you're stressed. You're never getting into that deep sleep or you're getting interrupted for whatever, or it's shortened because you just only got, you know, five hours of sleep glucose values the next day are very similar to that of somebody who's insulin resistant. Mm -hmm. Your body's just in this fight or flight. It wasn't able to recover the night before and insulin levels, you know, glucose is high, but our cell insulin sensitivity is decreased because of this. And so you might eat, you know, your normal go-to lunch that you respond really well to, and you could have twice the glucose response if you'd had a bad night of sleep the night before. So this is also just a huge awareness moment of like, wow, this is the impact I'm having, you know, so many 
people who mean well, go-getters, they want to achieve and do everything. They're like, I'll yeah. sleep when I'm dead type yep. of thing. And Did then it. you see, yeah, I think maybe we've all been there. Yeah. And then <laughs> you the data and you're like, oh, this is so much more impactful than I was at least telling myself. And so sometimes it takes that realization to understand the truth. Yep. Yeah. I totally went through that. It was like my first year of entrepreneurship. And it was like, I was totally staying up to like midnight, getting up at four. Like it was crazy. And then of course I'm having all this like emotional eating and stuff. Cause I'm just freaking exhausted and stressed and overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. And on top of it, my insulin resistance is down and I'll just share, you know, like for anybody listening, like if you're not sleeping, consider this, like insulin resistance is not just, I feel like most people think of that will make me fat or that will give me diabetes. Like those are the kind of the two things, but it's insulin is more than that. Insulin's awesome. Like I'm actually a huge fan of insulin. And if you think of like bodybuilders, bodybuilders understand insulin, I would say more than most people and have a generally friendly relationship with it because they know that they need insulin for their muscles to grow. <laughs> you, it also shuttles energy into our, our muscle cells and helps them grow. So that's why so many bodybuilders, yes, they eat carbs and they sleep like it's it's their job. Like it literally is their job. Part of their, the professional ones, they nap during the day to help increase insulin sensitivity and become more anabolic and grow their muscles. So it's like, think about it. if you're on like a body composition journey, if you want to like really change your physique and also be happy and calm, like it just sleeping, just sleeping can help you increase your insulin sensitivity. So now you're not only not getting fat and not getting diabetes, but you're also making it able for you, for yourself to be able to grow muscle, you know, which is huge. That's when like all your, all your efforts start working you know, and I like, for me, I'm, I'm a pretty good eater and I'm a pretty good worker outer, <laughs> but if I don't sleep and I don't get results, it just doesn't happen. I'd say I'll start gaining weight and everything goes downhill. So I appreciate you sharing that message. Um, what else have you guys discovered? Have you done on the NutriSense? I'm curious if you have had feedback on athletics, you know, with, with athletes, how have you seen, you know, have you learned anything interesting about the impact of exercise and activity, on blood sugar, any insights that might be interesting to people there? Yeah. So multiple insights. One big thing is just how important exercise is. You know, again, this is one of our core tenants. We can't neglect that and expect to have good outcomes. We really truly can't. So especially if you think about insulin resistance, it's really about increasing your insulin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. So when we have insulin resistance, that means that at the cellular level, that same amount of insulin is not working. And so the cells like no, nope, or ignoring it doesn't hear it. And so we have to pump out more insulin because our cells are not insulin sensitive. And one of the absolute best ways to increase your insulin sensitivity, make sure those cells are responding to the signal of insulin is exercising. Our bodies are 100% meant to be moving. Like we need to be using our muscles. We need to be strength training and we need to be moving. Amen. We, we can't be sedentary <laughs> all day. So, you know, a lot of people it's, it, I think diet is easier. They're like, tell me what to eat. I have to eat. So let's fix that. But it's like, I don't have to exercise. I don't have to manage stress. And so it's like, it's yeah. harder to address, but we, we can't ignore it. So at a high level, you know, exercise really of any type, but I am also, um, biased towards strength training as being just extremely important. Um, yeah. it really, really helps with that insulin sensitivity. And like you said, with the glycogen, I always talk about, you know, people are like how many carbs, what type of carbs we really can think about your carb tolerance based on your rate of glycogen clearance. Yeah. So it's like, clearing a lot of glycogen because you're fasting a lot, because you're exercising a lot, we have a little bit more wiggle room. Yep. You know, if you're pretty sedentary, if you're, you know, eating around the clock, or if you're not very insulin sensitive, then we really need to dial back at least at that point in time when you're at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's an amazing tool to just make more room for glucose coming in and use that as an energy source rather than, yeah, stimulating fat storage if our glycogen's already full. So we 100% need to be moving and strength training and exercising for that tenant. But then if we're thinking about like insights for athletes or, um, you know, performance strength training, we do have quite a few people using it to really dial in and they're using it for a few different applications. Um, one is, I would say it just really helps fine tune that learning process with like diet and experimentation. So yeah. 
anybody who's really taking their athletics seriously knows how important nutrition is and diet, but they also know that it can be a long road of tweaking things and trying to figure out what's working and what's not working. That learning process, I think can be slow sometimes. So we can speed that up of like, oh, this is working right away. This isn't switch that around. Um, so that you can really optimize energy. You want to be able to both recover and also perform well when you need to perform well and monitoring your glucose helps you do those two things. So, Oh my gosh. I just, sorry to cut you off. I'm like, I gotta wear one when I run a marathon. That would be so awesome to see for that duration. (laughs) Sorry. Okay. Keep going. Yeah, you absolutely do. Having them on marathons is so interesting or any like long, you know, endurance or also like really um, important. Like, like if you're doing a competition for like strength training or, you know, bodybuilding, like that peak, like I need to be at my best. That's also really helpful. Totally. Like working up to that moment. Uh-huh. Um, so specifically like, yeah, with refueling, like mm-hmm. what are the best carbs for your body? Like we touched on that. Not everyone's the same, how many, and at what time there's, these are, you know, the little nuances where it's like a little tweaking here and there can make a huge difference that you might not be able to like really feel or tell right away. So we can work on, you know, enough carbs to refuel, but uh, avoid having a huge spike where you kind of overshot the amount of carbs after a workout, because we don't want that huge spike too. That can be inflammation that can slow down your recovery. So it's about figuring out, you know, that right amount. And then also with that recovery. So you can see, especially with marathons and endurance, like bonking, like all of a sudden you can have a glucose that's looking good and then you hit a wall and it drops. We can help, you know, prevent that because we don't want to see that glucose drop off or you can see it to start to trend down or something like that. So uh-huh. recovery, bonking, um, you know, the, the list can go on and on, but we have a lot of people who really use it for endurance and also refueling and how much a lot of our strength training, um, bodybuilding customers are using it for that after workout refueling period of like, what's perfect, how many carbs, what type, and really dialing that in. If you want it to be super specific. Wow. Yeah. That's super insightful. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I, it makes me want to run a race just so I can see that <laughs> it is. I hope you guys can tell, like it, it is so fun. All of these tools that we have now, I'm like, we don't have to guess as much anymore. Like you can actually know, and it's not even expensive. <laughs> like you can just find out you don't have to guess anymore. It's so cool. You know, um, I love like this and heart rate variability and these little gifts that give us an inside snapshot of what's happening inside our body versus having to like go through a doctor. And I have to get this really expensive test. That's going to cost me thousands of dollars just to, it can just be ours at the uh, the click of a button, literally. Oh, by the way, the phone scanning thing, if you would like to start a lot of conversations at the gym, (laughs) I'm over here like freaking Iron Man or something like scanning my button on my arm. (laughs) I had so many people, they're like, I'm sorry, what are you doing? What is that? You know, a lot of, a lot of interest. And I even had some type one diabetic people stop me like, Oh, and I'm like, I'm sorry. I'm I'm not type one. I'm just super fascinated by this, but it definitely is like a, a, a conversation starter as as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I wanted to jump back if you don't mind a little bit more into food and, and reactions to food. Um, this is something I was wondering if you could address. I know that in, in my world in the keto low carb world, there seems to be a pervasive belief that like, you don't want your blood sugar to go up at all ever is kind of like that. What, how people come to me as clients, like, it's like, Oh, like it went over, it went over a hundred after I ate. And I'm like, that's okay. <laughs> like, <coughs> could you, excuse me, could you please address, um, you know, like why I guess it's okay for us to have an increase in blood sugar sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And thank you for asking that. That is a great <laughs> question because, you know, having tools like this can be a double-edged sword because we can take it too far. Mm-hmm. And I'm 100% not saying at all that we need to have a completely flat glucose line. There is a point of diminishing returns, you know, like a spike up to 140 and then back down to normal in two hours that's healthy response to carbohydrates. Um, We're not getting any extra advantage if that just spikes to like 110 and it stays within all those metrics we're looking at. There's a point where it just because it's smaller doesn't mean it's necessarily better. There's certain thresholds we're looking at. And 
you know, I always describe it as like, especially people who are keto and they're like, I really want to try to incorporate carbs again, but like I'm scared or I don't like when I see my glucose move up because I, I like seeing it at this perfect line. And I describe it as like, if let's imagine that w- this monitor actually measured fat, right? Like lipids in your system and you're eating fat at your meals. Would you, then you would also see fat increase in your meal time, and it should come back down to normal as well because you're eating fat. And then, you know, we should be able to process that, tolerate that, and that's perfectly healthy and fine. If yeah. we were also measuring that and we saw that increase and we wanted that flat line, yeah. and then we are also, you know, measuring other things, amino acids or something, then suddenly we have nothing to eat. Like right. it is completely healthy and natural for a carbohydrate based food to get broken down into glucose. And then that gets represented in the bloodstream, but then our body should be able to process it. You know, we should be able to dispose of it quickly and properly. And so if we're seeing that glucose spike instead go to those abnormal ranges, those high ranges, then it's like, okay, maybe we need to pull back on the carbs a little bit or the type of carbs or all these other things we can work with. But if it goes to a healthy levels from a nutrient dense food, then that's, that's normal. That's physiology. That's exactly how your body is supposed to be functioning. Um, so I really wanted to be clear that a glucose increase is not bad. We just want it to, you know, we don't want it to be all day long. We don't want you to go up and down, up and down, up and down, because if you're eating every two hours and constantly having an increase, then we're never getting in that fasted state either. You know, there's certain things we want to look for, but that doesn't mean it has to be flat. Mine's not flat. You know, a lot of people aren't flat and, and that's, that's good. That's healthy. That's fine. Yeah. That doesn't mean you have to eat carbs. I'm not saying you have to eat carbs yeah. either, but it's okay if you do. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I just need some backup. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, also, you know, for me, it's like really what I'm looking at is like, what do you wake up at? Is that baseline fasted number still high? We got some work to do because we don't want that mm-hmm. high. And then again, like you have said multiple times, how quickly can you bring it back down? That's also a really great indicator of insulin sensitivity because that means it's working. It's clearing yep. your bloodstream and it's getting it, getting it in your cells and it's doing its job. So that's more what I'm interested in than like, oh, oh, you went to 135. Oh no. Like, it's okay. Like, wh- yeah, but what mm-hmm. happened? How did your body respond to that? So thank you. Um, my other, my other question is like, for people who are doing like uh, ketogenic dieting, or I guess just anyone in general, something that we've been preaching for years in the nutrition world that I'm just curious if you've seen this, you may not have, (laughs) but we always say, Hey, start your day off with fat and protein so that you start yourself out for blood sugar wins throughout the day. Have you noticed anything like that in your numbers? Like, is it, have you noticed any truth in, in just your experience with that? Yeah, it's a good question. And and I have a couple things around that, but one is that just protein is extremely helpful for everything. So especially (laughs) glucose control though. So we always, we see benefits for everybody of including some protein at a meal always. So always having some high quality protein and even just the order of your macronutrients can make a huge difference. So like, let's say at breakfast, I'm eating scrambled eggs and oats. Like if I eat those eggs first and then the oats, that's going to be a totally different glucose response. than if I ate the eggs or ate the oats and then the eggs, so because it's slowing down the exactly. glycemic response, right? Yeah. It's slowing down digestion. It's blunting mm. that glucose spike and it's, it makes a huge difference. So I'm always saying, start your meal with the protein. It's also more satiating. So we're most, we're less likely to overeat. You know, it's like a win, win, win always of having protein at your meals and eating the protein first. But in relation to, I guess, like breakfast versus evening, one thing we've actually noticed, um, and this is in the literature as well, is that insulin sensitivity tends to decrease as the day goes on. So um, just like, you know, melatonin works on a circadian rhythm, our insulin sensitivity also works on a circadian rhythm. So we tend to be least insulin sensitive in the middle of the night when we're supposed to be sleeping. You know, that's normal. We're we're not supposed to be processing food at that time. We're supposed to be doing other things. And so we tend to see, and this varies, you know, depending on your circadian rhythm, your sleep wake cycle, but most people have the best insulin sensitivity, like in the middle of the day. Um, So like maybe afternoon hours. And so you might eat, you know, a meal of a steak and a sweet potato at 1 PM and have an amazing response and try that same exact meal at 7 PM. And it's three times as high because there's not as insulin sensitive at night. So that's a big thing we've seen is that, that 
nighttime values tend to be much higher with the same meal because of the decrease in insulin sensitivity. Wow. And that's kind of um, across the board. So one thing we're often doing is some people see the effect more dramatically than others is dialing back the carbs at dinner or trying to make that meal or a little bit earlier. Um, so that earlier time restricted eating. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something we're seeing with meal timing and people who are insulin resistant tend to have their worst responses at breakfast because they're having this dawn phenomenon where, so everybody around like four to 8 AM has this, you know, natural currents where your wake up hormones, adrenaline and cortisol are pumping out some glucose. It's your body's natural alarm clock. But if you're insulin sensitive, it's a little glucose peak and then it comes back down. And then usually like when you're awake, the first hour or two is your lowest glucose values in response to that. But a diabetic or an insulin resistant person, they're not able to compensate for that. So the body's starting to do their waking hormones, increase glucose. And because they're not insulin sensitive, it doesn't come back down. It just keeps rising. So for those people, you know, carbs at morning is just going to add totally fuel to the fire, make it way worse. But for an insulin sensitive person, usually we respond pretty well, as long as you're first breaking the fast with some fat or protein, because yeah. carbs on an empty stomach, definitely going to lead to a bigger spike. Totally Lose nuances, I guess, to your question. Plus who wants to only eat carbs? Gross. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no I, naked carbs. Yeah. It's not yeah, a good, yeah. good way to go. <laughs> Doesn't even taste good. <laughs> um, so, okay. That's really great insight. I love that. You know, it's, it brings so much to mind because there's all these talk, the, all this talk about like carbs at night. And I know that that can work for different reasons for people, you know, maybe they have issues with serotonin and they're keto mm -hmm. all the time, but then they can help induce a little bit of serotonin or at least use the carbs to blunt down cortisol and adrenaline a little bit so they can sleep. And I, I can see that, but for, for me, and I would say most of my colleagues who are very like fit and lean, I, I have said it a million times. And I have heard them say it too. Like, if you want to be lean, like just stop eating earlier in the day. Like instead of being in an intermittent faster, that's like, I made it to 2 a 2 PM and didn't eat anything. And then you eat all the things all night. Those are typically the people that I don't see really making their body composition goals. Whereas those of us who are eating a little earlier intermittent fasting and cutting that off earlier, I am seeing that. So that really correlates with what you're saying about insulin sensitivity. I'm not saying you can't guys, if you're in your groove and you're like, no, I intermittent fast and I love it. And it's working great for me. Please don't let me shame you out of that. Like do your thing. But I do find that like really interesting, um, that correlation with losing in, in the circadian rhythm of losing a little bit of insulin sensitivity as we go later into the day. And I think for anybody who is struggling with like, I say struggling because I do, I have seen it so much in the intermittent fasting world of getting in this habit of what is honestly just an obesity pattern. And that is eating all night long. And then you're just not hungry. Mm -hmm. So you're quote unquote intermittent fasting all morning because you're literally stuffed from stuffing yourself the night before I see that turn and really nasty for people. And they end up feeling like they have binge eating disorder and all, <laughs> all this stuff. So I think, you know, if that's the place you're in, like this could be a really, really cool tool to help you see like how your blood sugar is responding when you eat all your food later in the day versus eating more of your food earlier in the day. That's really cool insights for people. Cause sometimes just seeing that those numbers, seeing the re your reality check of how your body is responding, not what Dr. Exactly. So-and-so said on a podcast, like you're seeing you like that's, that's going to hit you pretty hard of like, okay, this makes way more sense for me to switch my life like this. So really, really powerful info yeah. and tool. <laughs> Yeah. And I think like for so many people, health and nutrition can be so confusing and frustrating because there are so many voices and, and different ideas and you can find out, you know, all the different plans and information out there. And so people get frustrated and they're trying to stick to something really rigidly and it's not working. And that's where yeah. I really like to change the viewpoint to thinking about these things more as discovery and experimentation of like trying something. Yes. I'm going to stick to it with discipline because you can't know if it worked or not, if you didn't stick to it. So stick to something, try it. But if you're, you know, you're like, I'm hitting this intermittent fasting window and I'm not making, reaching my goals try a different window, you know, try totally. something else. Like, and I see a lot of people get stuck in this pattern and it's really unhealthy of they're like, you know, I've been doing this for two years and I'm seeing no results. And I'm like, we need to switch it up. Like, yes. you know, I see that a lot and it's frustrating and they yeah. feel like they're doing everything right, but it maybe it's just not right for them. And so right. we, we have to tweak and experiment and view it as just like an 
an, a never ending experiment towards optimization. You know, we're never yes. going to be perfect, but we just have to keep trying. And that's where I think data is very helpful um, yes. to help reinforce that a little bit. Absolutely. I'm so aligned with your way of thinking. And I like to call it choose your own adventure. Cause I loved those books when I was little. So <laughs> it's like, okay, like try chapter eight and like go that way. But like, okay, how did that turn out? Let's, let's backtrack a little bit. And like, let's see what would have happened if you chose chapter four <laughs> and like go this way. And I love, like we, we should all feel feel free to do that. You know, I've met plenty of people who are vegans and their skin is glowing and they're happy and healthy and vibrant and exercising. And they're so happy and it's not aligned with me like at all. Like, I don't want to do that, but I don't care. Let them do their thing. It's working well for them. And then I, my invitation always is like, but if it stops working well, don't pigeon your pigeon, pigeonhole yourself into it. Same thing with keto mm -hmm. or paleo mm -hmm. or any approach you find yourself in. Like, I think it's so important for us to remember, like, is it really working well for you? And are you able to jump outside of it for a second, just to see if there might be something better? I think that's a really healthy approach to optimizing our health because guess what? We're all aging. We're all changing. Our life situations are changing. We have different like exercise routines, like so many factors change over the years. So it's cool to be able to like keep an open mind and then also get valuable feedback on what you're at, what results you're actually getting from those mm -hmm. strategies that you're doing. So super, super awesome. Um, all right. So people, if you, they want to try NutriSense, where do they go? And you, you tell them the, the options too, right? Cause don't you have like a mm -hmm. short one and there's different lengths of time you can have it for? Yeah, absolutely. And, and our goal really is that everybody has access to this data, even if it's for a very short amount of time, because we truly believe that, you know, this type of data is obviously valuable for not just diabetics, but for everybody to really learn something about themselves. So we offer this no commitment, just one CGM, which lasts 14 days. When you get the app, you can have access to your data and information forever and you get the dietitian and that's 175. So it's one time, no commitment. Um, and then we awesome. have monthly recurring plans where, you know, you might be getting two CGMs a month and you're working on something. Maybe if you really need to experiment with a bunch of different diets or if you have a lot of, a lot of weight you want to lose or, you know, reverse prediabetes, something like that, I would recommend a monthly plan. And those range in price depending on how long you commit. Um, so it can be anywhere from 185 a month to 350 a month, depending on if you're going on a month to month or if you're committing all the way to a year. So two CGMs a month for 185 a month plus the dietitian is pretty affordable in my view. Totally. You know, the hardware itself is relatively expensive and that's what holds us back from making it even cheaper. But our goal is really to make this as accessible as possible for people. Yeah. And if you want to sign up, you just go to the website, you know, nutrisense.io. You just have to fill out a quick, quick health questionnaire just so we can make sure, you know, you're an appropriate fit for it. We, we can't accept like, you know, a few people at this point in time, if you're on insulin therapy, that's uh, a liability and you need an MD to work with you. So you can get this device through um, a prescription with an MD. If, if you are somebody like a type one diabetic or, um, if you are like under 18, you know, a few things like that, but okay. for the most part, we accept pretty much everybody. So you just go on the website, fill out a quick questionnaire, and then we'll ship you the devices. So it comes to you. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to get a prescription or take care of, you know, we take care of all of that legwork for you. Yeah. Super awesome. And you guys did give me a discount that I can share. So I'll link that in the show notes, you guys. So it's $25 off. Um, and the code is coach Tara and I'll put a link below so you guys can access that. But like truly like your guys's customer service is like Amazon level. Like it's like really <laughs> impressive. It's not like, Oh, we kind of say that we know, like you guys show up. I was like, wow, this is really impressive. And that's who L Russ who connected us to, she was also mm -hmm. saying the same thing. She was like, you're going to be blown away by <laughs> how they show up on the, on the dietitian side of things. So it really is really impressive. So for that amount of money to get that kind of level of service, plus all that data on yourself, that's ridiculous. That's such a, an amazing offer. So really, really encourage anybody who's listening. If this interests you at all, I'm telling you, it'll be one of the most impacting things you do for yourself and your health, because you won't forget like you, you that's something that you get to keep with you forever. Like, you know, that you have a great blood sugar mm -hmm. response to white rice and bananas. That is so awesome to know that. <laughs> 
that, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's kind of an investment in yourself of knowing yourself at a deeper level and how you actually respond to food. So that way, when someone tries to shame you and say, don't eat bananas, Kara, you're like, I- I'm good. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. Empowering. <laughs> yeah. Very empowering. So, um, yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap it up, but thank you so much for joining us today. That was so informative, so much good information. I know all of us are going to be thinking anybody listening is going to be taking that with us for a while. So thank you so much, Kara, for sharing all this with us today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me.